This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Good morning and welcome to Racing Across America as we kick off another week. Monday morning, I'm Seth Merrill. Thanks for joining me this morning. Coming up a little later on, Ellis Starr, the uh, National Racing Analyst for Equibase. He'll join us for a little recap of some of the stakes action. As I said just a couple of moments ago on the Handicappers Report, typically we're joined by Mike Penner of the Horse Racing Radio Network, but he was down in Florida covering the Claiming Crown for the radio network, and uh, travel plans got a little bollocked up, so he's probably in the air uh, right about now, but I, I reached out to Ellis Starr, who typically joins Mike on Fridays on the Horse Racing Radio Network and does a stakes preview, but we'll recap some of the stakes action with Ellis in a few minutes. Coming up towards the bottom of the hour, Catskill T Steve Turjanian from Monticello Raceway. We'll get some thoughts from Catskill Steve on the racing on the harness side this afternoon at Monticello. Towards the end of the hour, Teresa Gennaro has the Brooklyn Backstretch blog, but also writes for various racing publications. Of course, you see her all summer long in the pink sheet at the Saratogian. But most recently, uh, she covered the uh, New York Racing Association board meeting for uh, the Blood Horse, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Last Wednesday was the board meeting. Some news came out of that. So we'll hit on that with uh, Teresa at the bottom of our hour. Don't forget, uh, Bet 50, Get 50 continues here at Capital OTB. If you're not yet a Capital Bets wagering account holder this month, December, if you uh, sign up and become a Capital Bets account holder and bet $50 into your account, Capital OTB puts $50 into your account. Bet 50, Get 50. Learn more about it at CapitalOTB.com. This sounds like fun. Lucky Saturdays down here at the Clubhouse Racebook, December 14th, 21st, and 28th. Uh, all patrons will receive an entry slip to submit for random drawings. There'll be drawings on the next three Saturdays, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., and 4 p.m. Each drawing, two pa patrons will be selected. Uh, one of the patrons will get a chance to win in the cash cube machine or the big wheel. In the cash cube machine, patrons have 20 seconds to grab as much funny money as possible, and then whatever the total amount they receive, uh, they'll get to uh, make a win, place, or show bet on the next race at Aqueduct for that amount. That sounds like fun. The other patron either spins the big wheel or gets a chance at some uh, racing merchandise or bet vouchers. Uh, it sounds like a, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. Again, right down here at the Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue in Albany. Lucky Saturdays, next three Saturdays, December 14th, 21st, and 28th. And coming up this coming Sunday, December 15th, right here at the Clubhouse Racebook. My co-host on Loose on the Lead, the Sunday morning program we do together here on Capital OTB TV, Steve Bick, will have a $500 bankroll. Uh, you can show up here starting at 11 a.m. on uh, next Sunday. 25 patrons will be randomly drawn at 1.30. Steve will start actually placing bets earlier than that. Um, he'll, he'll be looking at the uh, uh, racing starting at about 12.30. He'll continue on till about 4.30, $500 bankroll, and again, 25 patrons that will be randomly selected here at the Clubhouse Racebook get to participate in that bankroll. That's next Sunday. Again, right here at the Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue in Albany. News uh, from the past few days, some news came out <clears throat> over the uh, uh, weekend, actually just prior to the weekend, came out on Friday from the Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association. They have an offshoot that is the American Graded Stakes Committee. They are the committee that puts together uh, the, the grading of the American stakes uh, for the uh, calendar year. They put together the 2014 graded stakes. Uh, there are 455 stakes that have been graded. That's two fewer than in 2013. As Matt Haggerty says in his uh, daily racing forum co column for the number of graded events to keep pace with the decline in the number of race days that, that are happening in the country and that's subsequently tied into the full crop as well the number of uh, this year would have had to have shrink by uh, 14 races they only shrunk by two we had Ricker Hammerley on yesterday from Santa Anita he's a member of the graded stakes committee we talked a little bit about some of these issues you can pull that up on the uh, YouTube channel, all the uh, morning programming is archived. Again, go to capitalotb.com, bottom of the page, 
There's a link to YouTube. But again, loose on the lead yesterday, we did talk with Hammerly, who was on the Graded Stakes Committee, about some of these broader issues. And uh, so you can pull that back up in the archive. I uh, looked at a couple of races. It's interesting. Again, there were some downgrades. There were some upgrades. Uh, I think I still have it. I know I still have it linked on Equidaily. The uh, press release that was put out by the uh, Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association and the American Great Stakes Committee that names specifically the races that are moved up and moved down, all the numbers of races that were changed, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, there was one race that was upgraded to grade one status, the La Troyenne at Churchill Downs. Two races were downgraded from grade ones to grade twos. As Hammerly said, moving races up to grade one is a big concern to the committee. They take that very seriously, but even more importantly, moving down is, is taken with a, uh, you know, a great deal of uh, care and, and seriousness. The two races, though, include one at Saratoga, the Prioress at Saratoga and the Princess Rooney at Calder were both downgraded uh, from grade ones to grade twos for the 2014 calendar. And I, just out of interest, I pulled up the results of the Prioress for the past, both, both the Prioress and the Princess Rooney, for the past three years. And, and, you know, looking at the fields, I guess I can't really disagree too much. Just taking a look at the Prioress 2013, the winner was Lighthouse Bay for George Weaver. Uh, underneath Wildcat Lily, Irish Loot, So Many Ways, Little Rocket, Kawhi Katie. You know, there's a couple of recognizable names in there. There's certainly some, some horses that are stakes quality performers and whatnot. I'm not quite sure that is a grade one field. So Lighthouse Bay wins the Prioress in 2013. 2012, Emma's Encore upsets, a slight upset for uh, uh, Alan Jerkins. Underneath, Judy the Beauty, nice horse for Wesley Ward. Agave Kiss, who early in the career was something special. Then things became maybe a little more dicey. Jazzy Idea, Livy McKenzie, uh, two ND we uh, underneath, and uh, so again, uh, a field that the names aren't necessarily jumping off the page as grade one level names. You know, these are nice horses, nice graded stakes horses, not necessarily of a grade one quality. And then going back to uh, 2011, prior rest was one run at Belmont Park. Uh, it was won by Her Smile for Todd Pletcher and Bobby Flay underneath Pomeroy's Pist Pistol, Alienation. Again, not quite sure, nice horses, but not uh, particularly of grade one quality. Now, given that you go down the uh, list of winners, you can find some very nice winners uh, for the prior rest. If you go back, 2008, Indian Blessing, 2007, Dream Rush, Wildcat Betty B in 2006, 2002, Carson Hollow, 2001, Extra Heat. So certainly you go back in the, uh, the past, uh, the, the list of winners for the prior rest. There are some names that jump off the page as being very, very talented. But the, just looking, as I say, at the charts from the past three years, maybe it's a little dicier. So the move down for the prior rest, maybe not a shock. Uh, looking at the last three years from the Princess Rooney, and again, that one was also a move down. Princess Rooney is run at Calder. In 2013, the Princess Rooney was won by Starship Truffles. Judy the Beauty was second. Uh, Starship Truffles goes out for Marty Wolfson. Again, I'm just looking down. There was a field of uh, 12. Centrique was, was in the race, was a winner on the uh, uh, Calder card, this, uh, the Calder Stakes card this weekend. Um, so there's, some again, some stakes quality performers, not quite sure what level. However, that, that was the 2013 Princess Rooney. However, go back to the 2012 Princess Rooney. Winner was Musical Romance. Underneath that, uh, Nicole H. And then you go down, and I guess the rest of the field isn't quite a, as impressive, but Musical Romance was the 2011 uh, Eclipse winner for, as a female sprinter. So that's a pretty good, uh, and wound up as the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Sprint win, rent, winner. So that was just two years ago. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good addition to uh, uh, the uh, win rolls of the Princess Rooney down there at Calder. And again, that was just a couple of years ago. Go back three years, uh, Princess Rooney, Sassy Image was the uh, winner. Underneath, though, Musical Romance. Again, an Eclipse winner in there. So for me, as I looked the last three years at the prior rest, again, the move from grade one to grade two, maybe not a shock. But looking at the last three years from the Princess Rooney, you know, the field's in total, but that's the way racing is. I mean, you're never going to get a Breeders' Cup, maybe. But otherwise, you're not going to get a field top to bottom of grade one level performers. 
but you're looking for, if there's one or two, and certainly an, an Eclipse winner shows up a couple of years in a row out of the last three years, maybe the Princess Rooney was a little dicier as it moved down from a grade one to a grade two. But uh, again, those were the uh, changes, as I say. I have uh, up on Equidaily the link to the uh, uh, Toba press release that went out the end of last week, uh, actually listing all the particulars on the graded, graded changes that will be put into effect for 2014. Also notable over the weekend, it was announced that uh, grade one winner flat out was retired, goes out on a high note, wins the uh, cigar mile as a seven-year-old. Certainly uh, uh, not, not a surprise that this horse goes to the sidelines and again, did it on a high note. A uh, good way to go out. This is a horse that uh, a uh, 29 uh, starts in the career, nine wins, five seconds, five third place finishes, uh, well over three and a half million dollars in the bank. So uh, a nice blue collar kind of stakes level performer. May not have been as flashy as some other big names you see out there, but flat out certainly one that uh, got it done on multiple occasions and as noted, did it pretty impressively in that cigar mile uh, and uh, goes out a winner, flat out, retired. <clears throat> also, some more interesting news that came out towards the end of last week, and I, I don't think I mentioned it. It came out, <clears throat> excuse me, on Thursday, uh, late Thursday, and I don't think I mentioned it on Friday, but Dan Silver will be rejoining Naira as the director of television and interactive platforms. Dan Silver had been uh, the head of the media uh, department down there at Naira, shifted over to become, uh, I think his title was director of racing operations over at uh, Penn National um, and had been at Penn National for a while, less than a year, I think, though, or maybe around a year, but, but it had made some interesting uh, moves at Penn National. He was instrumental in starting that Penn Mile, which has become a nice race for them. They've only run it once, but it was certainly nice this year, and you expect that will stick to their calendar. It was a race that had fit in a nice spot on the calendar, attracted some good horses this year. So the Penn Mile looks like it will be with Penn National for a while. Also, Dan was uh, instrumental in putting together that uh, Thursday afternoon pick four that combined the last two at Belmont with the first two at Penn National uh, after the Penn National season ended, after the Belmont season ended, and they uh, were able to total up uh, uh, the handle on that pick four, and how it affected the rest of the Penn National card. It turned out to be very uh, beneficial for Penn National. I know some folks had a lot of fun playing that. Again, combined the last couple at Belmont, first couple at Penn National, but it's one of those that, and eh, once you've looked at the first couple at Penn National, you may bet into those as well, maybe play a double over there, and then maybe pr proceed on looking at that Penn National card. And again, looking at the handle figures, it looks like that was the case. So Dan Silver, a guy with some uh, interesting ideas, fairly young guy, comes out of that University of Arizona racetrack program years and years ago, had been at Naira for quite a while, again, in the media department, moves over now as the director of television and interactive platform, so we'll see what he does there. Uh, and again, uh, he, he was instrumental at Naira in really upgrading and, and putting together a nice website for uh, them, uh, their, the Naira website. Subsequently, has been changed a little bit in his absence as well. But I've always said as racetrack websites go, that's uh, one of the ones that I find more informative and, and kind of easy to follow. All right, we're going to head to our uh, first break. As we do, though, do want to uh, uh, show you one of the races from Hong Kong. And I'll, I'll mention these Hong Kong races, mentioned them over the weekend uh, as these were run, run Saturday night into Sunday morning here in the United States. The uh, Hong Kong international races were Sunday in Hong Kong. So the results came out here yesterday. Four international races, year in and year out. These are strong international fields. Bill, Bill Nader over there, another former Naira employee, but now over in Hong Kong. He and his team do a great job uh, putting together very, very strong fields. And uh, th this weekend was no exception. We had a couple of uh, uh, horses with the United States rooting interest, King Kresa and Little Mike. Uh, in the uh, Hong Kong Vaz, you had an international field that was a lot of fun just to to follow because again, there were some horses that certainly folks who follow internationally would be familiar with, but also we had the Fugue in the Hong Kong Vaz coming out of the nice effort in the Breeders' Cup. The Fugue uh, runs a good second in the Hong Kong Vaz, running third was Dune it in for Mel Melbourne Cup winner, Red Cado, a very good uh, horse on the international scene. That race, however, was won by Dominant. Uh, the uh, Hong Kong Sprint was won by uh, Lord Kenaloa, uh, gets that one done. 
Those are two races that had international appeal, but after that uh, were the races that had some appeal for those of us here in the United States. The Hong Kong Cup, little Mike ran in that, Mike Smith uh, was riding, Dale Romans trains, little Mike winds up ninth in a field of 12, so a little bit of a disappointment there. Smith was quoted as saying he had the horse kind of tucked in, and when he pulled the horse out, just kind of lost too much ground. Little Mike went wide on the turn, and Smith wondered if he kept him in, maybe he would have been better, but then he didn't think he would have gotten the run, so he's just a uh, little bit of a traffic situation for little Mike. King Creesa, We'll watch the race after the race. Mike Smith said, uh, as the race went further and further, Mike King Creesa uh, had his head higher and higher, and just at the uh, the latter stages of the race, just wasn't putting forth the effort that that you would like to see. But King Creesa, as we'll see in the replay, out there and kind of making himself heard early in the race, subsequently is going to wind up finishing. Um, 12th in a field of 14. King Creesa will be horse number 11. The call, this is in Hong Kong, the call is going to be in English though, so you'll be able to pick King Creesa out. King Creesa again, Mike Smith on board, Jeremiah Engelhart trains, and as you heard earlier on the handicappers report, Jeremiah Engelhart based in, at the Finger Lakes. So a lot of fun to uh, see that crew out there in Hong Kong. Again, it was a disappointment, but hats off to them for taking the shot, going over there. The trip put King Creesa behind the eight ball a little bit, came off the plane uh, and, and suffered a little travel sickness, subsequently rebounded. But a week out from the race, again, you get a hiccup like that, it's going to be tough to overcome. But we will watch now, going into the first break, the Hong Kong Mile. Again, King Creesa, horse number 11. You'll watch that one and have a little uh, rooting interest there. Uh, as we go into the first break, we'll watch that coming out of the first break. Ellis Starr from Equibase will give us a little review, recap, some of the stakes action from this weekend. Stay tuned. All of that coming up. We're ready now. They're off in the long jeans, Hong Kong ball, and there's a great line out of the gates, and the favourite Gold Fun is the first to break it. Deleuze wants to take up the early lead with King Creaser quickly over into second. Dan excels handy together with Pure Champion and Helene Spirit, real specialist, are next with Helene Spirit driving forward. Uh, they're followed by Sky Lantern and Moonlight Cloud, both covering a bit of ground. Then Gordon Lord Byron beaten for speed. The Great Linton defends from Glorious Days. Third last packing whiz from Shamalgan and Extensions last of all. Helene Spirit's got the rousing King Creaser, rolls four to the thousand to poke his head in front. And Deleuze has got gold fun in it into a terrific spot third. Over on the inside, pure champion Dan Excel the other. Followed by Linton, real specialist, one off in the mare, Moonlight Cloud is midfield, and in a three wide position as they race down the side of the course, says she'll certainly have to earn a victory. A length and a half to Sky Lantern, just shading Gordon Lord Byron. Two further back to Glorious Days, packing whiz, second last Shemalgan, and extension popping off the fence is last of all. Onto the home turn, and it's King Creaser ahead in front of Helene Spirit, the rails. Gold Fun is stalking the leaders. Real specialist under pressure from Dan Excel, pure champion for the back to Moonlight Cloud. She's under immense pressure and Glorious Day zip past her as Deleuze goes for home on Gold Fun, drawing two lengths clear. Glorious Day's coming into the race fresh. He's cutting back the margin. It's Gold Fun in front of Glorious Day's. The outside looms. Packing Wiz going to third for Glorious Day's. Great training performance by John Size. Going in cold and winning the Hong Kong mile. Glorious Day's for Douglas White beats Gold Fun. Then uh, Packing Wiz, real specialist and Gordon Lord Byron and closing off. Further back to Helene Spirit. Then Moonlight Cloud is covered ground from Pure Champion Extension, Shamalgan. Linton couldn't get into it from King Creaser and Sky Lanterns finished back at the rear of the field. I'm Mark Cassano. Join me Saturday mornings at 10 for Down the Stretch. We'll inform, analyze, and welcome in the biggest names in racing. So join me Saturday mornings at 10 for Down the Stretch right here on the OTB television network. Here in upstate New York, no one provides bettors with more wagering options than Capital OTB. Our network of ranch and easy bet locations stretches from the mid-Hudson Valley all the way to the Canadian border and west to central New York. So whether you need to place a bet, fund your Capital Bets account, or watch the next big race, all the action is just around the corner. A full list of our branch and easy bet locations can be found online at CapitalOTB.com. Capital OTB the better and most convenient choice for wagering in upstate New York. I'm Steve Bick, inviting you to join me Sunday, December 15th at the Clubhouse Racebook. I'll be handicapping the day's races live and managing a $500 bankroll for 25 lucky patrons. To be part of the bankroll team, sign up at the Clubhouse Sunday by 1.30. We'll see you then. Let's win together. 
Wagering at CapitalOTBBet.com is as easy as one, two, three. One, Capital Bet TV, the fastest and easiest online wagering experience where you can monitor five different tracks simultaneously. Two, Capital Bet Express. Its straightforward program layout and interactive handicapping information lets you build your wager quickly and efficiently. And three, Capital Bet Pro, designed especially for the professional horse player. CapitalOTBBet.com. Log on today. I'm Anthony Mormino. Join me weekdays at 9 for the Handicappers Report. We'll handicap the top tracks across the country and help you prepare for the day in racing. That's the Handicappers Report, weekdays at 9, only on the OTB TV network. Welcome back to Racing Across America. Seth Merrow in here on this Monday morning. We're going to do a little preview of some of the stakes action, just waking, waiting to make contact with Ella Starr, National Racing Analyst of Equibase. As I say, typically on Mondays, we're joined by Mike Penna, Horse Racing Radio Network, to do a little stakes uh, recap action. Mike Penna got in touch with me yesterday. Mike was down in Florida handling uh, the uh, claiming crown for the Horse Racing Radio Network, and he said he had a little, little got bumped a few times uh, with the connection in Atlanta. And so uh, supposedly Mike will be on a plane right about now, hopefully heading home and hopefully doing so safely. But in the uh, interim, I reached out to uh, Ellis Starr, again, National Racing Analyst for Equibase, but he also joins Mike on the Horse Racing Radio Network regularly on Fridays to preview some stakes action. So I thought it'd be perfect to pull him in to do a little recap. Good morning, Ellis. Good morning, Seth. Good morning, racing fan. Happy to have you on board because uh, it was a fun weekend of stakes action, claiming crown down at Gulfstream. We had some nice stakes action over at Calder as well, and a very nice performance that has us maybe excited for next year, looking out at the uh, Hollywood Starlet on the West Coast. We're going to touch on some of those races with you. And Ellis, let's get... Oh, before I do that, Ellis, uh, I, you're the first guest this week, but I asked everybody certainly last week that Thanksgiving... Uh, uh, Weekend of racing was very, very good. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. We'll take charge and game on dude in the Clark. Uh, the quirky, the very funny Remsen with that pace, but I still thought a very nice performance, is, performance from the top three there. Tapature uh, uh, at uh, Kentucky, uh, flat out in the Cigar Mile. Any impressions from the big weekend of racing last weekend? Well, I've got to put it on a personal perspective. I, I, two, two very unfortunate, two horses that I both picked on our HR, and as, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm part of that team on our preview show we do from 6 to 7. It's available on podcast as well. And two horses I really liked. One was Toasting, who got beat by a nose by Wedding uh -huh. Toast at 32 to 1, even though I could give out the exactus. So that was a heck of a race. And, and they both those Phillies ran huge. And then, even though Flat Out was tremendous, Private Zone ran his eyeballs out to hold second, clearly so, at 32 to 1. Another horse I really liked in those races. Um, certainly. Those were the, the things that I kind of are both happy and upset about. Nice to have double-digit horses run so well. Um, and the, uh, the the thing about that pace and the Remsen, um, I don't know. My, i I got to tell you, my first impression, regardless of the efforts, is it, it's phony. When you look at any race like that, I need to see these horses run in a regular race. I mean, that's almost like a turf and, and the worst of an all-weather track race where they go slow, so slow and then sprint the last eighth of a mile like turf and turf it's okay because you expect those kicks but on dirt you don't do that so uh, i really need to see <laughs> something better uh, i need to see these horses run in legitimate pace races before you're going to get anything out of me in terms of my feelings yeah I, I think you're in the same boat a lot of people are i i thought honor code was kind of running against his style to come back in the stretch like that i'm giving him points but, yeah, it was so run in such a quirky way, it's hard to know what to come away with that exactly. But I think all three of those are at least going to be worth watching next time out. All right, let's shift our attention to this Saturday. Again, the Claiming Crown down at Gulfstream Park. I picked a couple of races there that I found interesting. Certainly uh, the Ken Ramsey juggernaut was in play over the weekend. But there was an uh, interesting horse on the card as well in the uh, Claiming Crown Express uh, the Claiming Crown Express had a purse of $110,000, six furlong race. And Ellis, looking at your selections that were provided for the full card on Equibase, 
I see you like Rio Bobo. I also thought Rio Bobo was going to be a lot of fun. We're going to watch the stretch run here as Rio Bobo at one to two uh, wins this one off by more than a couple of lengths. And I think not only was this impressive for Rio Bobo, but I think this helps to flatter the venerable Ben's cat for the venerable King Leatherberry, who only a week and a half prior to this race had uh, beaten, just beaten, Rio Bobo up at Penn National in the, the night before Thanksgiving. So hats off to Ben's cat, but a nice performance by Rio Bobo. Yeah, you know, Ben's cat broke Rio Bobo's, what, nine race winning streak or something like that. And uh, and, and he wasn't uh, really disgraced, beating a half, beating, beating half a length. And, you know, when you, it, it, of course, it's, it's 2020 now, but for most people, when you handicap a starter allowance, you, you want to see, you know, how they qualified, what they've beaten lately. When you see a, starter, a horse that's still eligible for a starter allowance, which is essentially what all the claiming crown races were, when you see that and you see a horse that just ran, you know, won the stake, he won the Maryland Million Sprint by five and a half over Action Andy, who's a stakes winner, open stakes winner, and then, of course, being beaten by Ben's Cat in a quarter million dollar race. This was a class drop, so he really did tower here. and One to two was rightfully so. Uh, you know, it's just interesting, interesting race, and, and, and he is a nice, nice sprinter. I don't know that he's great at stakes quality, but he can win a lot of listed stakes. I hope they run him in a couple of New York next year, because I think he's good enough to compete in a lot of those 100 granders they throw up there. Yeah, he's won over half a million. Well, actually, no, he's he's probably up close to 600,000. Um, so you would think they'll, they'll try to maybe step it up a little bit next year and see what they can do. But certainly, uh, as you say, had a win streak snap, a s impressive win streak snap last time by Ben's Cat, but back starting a new one on Saturday. I also pulled up another race that I found really interesting from uh, Gulfstream and that Claiming Crown on Saturday was the uh, Claiming Crown Tiara. And uh, we're going to watch in here the number six, Dina Allen's Kitten for, again, the aforementioned Ken and Sarah Ramsey juggernaut, Chad Brown trains. And I just wanted to show this one because, wow, what a burst about mid-stretch for this horse to get up, sitting way in the back of the pack for most of the early part of the race. Dina Allen's Kitten was the four to five favorite in here, the number uh, six horse. Keep your eyes on the number six because this uh, this was just a, a very impressive, impressive run down the stretch. Yeah, they ran the last, it's hard, always hard for me to do this, but the last 3 um in 31, and he was about 8 to 10 back. So you figure, uh, you know, about, it's really six lengths a second, but roughly two seconds. So he came home in 29, probably a little less 29 shade, under 29 for for uh, a for for for, uh, for a furlong and a half, which is that's just smoking. That's like yeah. 22 second quarter. Um, it's just really fast. He, he he is on top of his game. He makes this big run when you kick him outside. You, know, you mentioned the Ramsey juggernaut, and and certainly he was hoping to repeat his big year last year when he won so many, and I think he ended up with two on this year's card. It was very disappointing for him. Um, of course, this one, trained by Brown, uh, then he won one more trained by Maker, so they didn't have the success nearly they did last year. But what an impressive horse, and, and he got a 108 Echo Bay speed figure, which actually was the same as Rebo Bubbles 108, um, which is very good for this level, because essentially this is you know high-level claiming. But you've got a multiple winning claimer, a multiple winning uh, horse here who's now won two stakes in a row. And again, you can take him back to New York and, and when when the turf racing starts up again in the spring. And you know they're going to have a lot of those overnights for a hundred grand. He can pick up sixty grand over and over. And just another great uh, horse. And you know not one of those that uh, I think uh, they picked him up uh, earlier, but then he broke his maiden and straight maiden. So I really. I just love this late kick, as you said. Yeah, it was really impressive down the stretch. And again, you had that one on top on your Equidaily, uh, Equibase uh, selections as well. And just to touch on, uh, don't have any video, but just to touch on, you alluded to it earlier, Major Marvel wins uh, the Claiming Crown Emerald for Maker and Ramsey. But they were disappointed in the highlight of the day, the Claiming Crown Jewel, Benny the Maestro, uh, winds up uh, running sixth for them as the 9-5 to five favorite. But Nevada Kid gets it done for uh, Nick Zito in that uh, claiming crown jewel. you got to be happy for Nicky Z because, you know, he's not having a great year, and it's got to really perk him up. This is a very useful horse. Uh, he can run on the lead. He can run from off the pace. And, 
He was very impressive. It was a nice way to close out the day. There weren't uh, there were a couple chalks like Reba Bobo and Dina Allen Kitten, but other than that, some nice stuff. And I and I just got really lucky on the day with my. She don't usually do Gulfstream. I may mean, do was we get more into January and the three old races on Saturdays. But because the claiming ground card was so interesting, I had the option of putting out the sheet and. I ended up Didn't with eight one winners that was, you had as one my that was, contenders and four on top. I just I, I feel just lucky because again it was nice to beat a few favorites and get some nice stuff out there. And didn't you have one in here that you had fair odds that, that were fairly low and, and won a race at uh, at double digit? Correct. Well, that was kind of crazy. At Carolina Lizard in the first right. race of the sequence, the third race was five to one in the morning line and. I wasn't even looking at the odds. I just bet the horse to win and played pick threes um, going from him in singling Rebo Bobo in the fifth race. And uh, I look up and I see him battling and I see the inquiry sign. And he went off at 34 to 1. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's, that's something I don't take big credit for because I expect him to go at 5 to 1. But I thought between the favorite, Winnerlicious, Courtney Ryan and Carolina Lizard, I thought none of the other horses in the race could really win, so I made them all about two to one. He was my third pick, but five to two. When you make a, when you consider a horse's odds should be so and so, and they're you know fifteen times that, I mean, you got to bet. I think <laughs> everybody's got to remember to be counterintuitive sometimes and just take a stand. Don't worry about what the public's doing and say, "Come on, I can't miss a horse paying seventy bucks." Yeah, I, I I'm looking at your sheet here, and you got fair odds five to two on Carolina Lizard. So nice call there, and and, and you make a great point I, I handicap and i don't when i put my uh, selections over on the equidaily website i don't put fair odds but I, I say to people if i have them listed top pick second pick third pick and the top pick is you know five to two or whatever and the second pick is 12 to one or something take a look at that second you know if you if the horse up there in your mix is flirting around at some decent odds and as i say even if you didn't have fair odds at five to two if if all of a sudden you looked and one of your horses in, in Ellis's mix is 34 to 1, hey, take a second look, because uh, certainly those are the kind that make the game fun. Ellis, let's well, take, go ahead. Well, real, real quick, let me, let me give your listeners a hint when they look at your picks, and you as well in Equidaily, you know, for any handicapper that makes three picks a race, let's just say, and you really don't want to go to the trouble of figuring out what you think the probability is, just make them all 3 to 1. If you have four picks, make them all four to one. That's something my mentor taught me 20 years ago. It works very well for at least figuring out, oh, well, you know, I'll bet my second or third pick here. So whatever number of horses you have, just make those odds. Two horses, two to one. Three horses, three to one. Four horses, four to one. At least it gives you, it gives you a bar that you can then measure against the betting. Yeah, that's a good idea. See, because as you say, it gives you that standard that you can then go off of. All right, let's shift our attention uh, across town, essentially. Can't believe these guys are going head-to-head -head like this and lost in the mix of the claiming crowd. There were some nice races over at Calder as well. I do want to mention the Fred Hooper. Chaba repeated. This was the race that got him started on a little bit of a streak last year, so he gets it done. Uh, Valiant Girl wins the My Charmer. We're going to take a look at the Tropical Park turf. Speaking of which, which uh, is going to get it done in here uh, at nine to two. Speaking of which, which trained by Christophe Clement. This is a horse that started the career in Europe, and since then hadn't shown too much, at least in stakes company. Going back to August, had a win and allowance optional at Monmouth, but uh, the start just prior to this was in the three coins up at Aqueduct and ran fifth. Comes up uh, on Saturday, shows up again at nine to two. The number two horse, speaking of which, gets it done. Tropical turf handicap over at Calder, running second will be the two to one favorite, Tector Drachum, uh, uh, for uh, Bill Mott, running third, Bad Debt. But again, uh, speaking uh, of which, a European who kind of took a little while to to get things started. We're watching the stretch run here, and is speaking of which, getting it done for Christophe Clement. Yeah, he came here. He was all world. I mean, in his first race in the U.S. last year, Twilight Derby, he made the lead and ran second to a really good horse named Grandeur. And uh, then not much, just a second-level allowance win in June. And the public, I guess, at 9-2 to two, really thought he had a big chance. I, I discounted him completely, but he did get a 115 Echo Bay speed figure, the best greatest stakes speed figure of the weekend, believe it or not. Some of the uh, other non-graded stakes, like 8 to Fast to Catch and some of the claiming crown horses got higher, but it was really good. So maybe Clemence turned him around. Uh, I was fairly impressed. Tetra Drock was a favorite of mine. He was sold privately last year, bought by the Wachtel, sent to Mott, and, and I thought he had a huge shot. But speaking of which, just rolled right by him uh, with a nice effort. 
Yeah, it was a, a very nice effort. Though, keep a you know maybe the light bulb is kind of turned down now in the United States, at least in Stakes Company. So we'll see what Christophe Clement does with that one. And finally, Ellis, a race that I really want to get your opinion on. I know you follow uh, Southern California racing very closely, handicapping it often as well for uh, their websites and for Equibase uh, various uh, venues. I wanted to touch on Saturday's. Uh, 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 Hollywood Starlet grade one event, half a million dollar purse, mile and a 16th for the two-year-old Phillies. We're going to watch the stretch run here and see streaming getting it done in the second career start for Bill Mott. Broke the maiden pretty impressively in the middle of November, uh, not Bill Mott, for Bob Baffert. Uh, broke the maiden pretty impressively in the middle of November. And being that it is Bob Baffert, Kind of surprised to see this one sneak away at 10 to 1. Now, the betting public was looking at Rosalind off the nice third place finish in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Philly. Rosalind winds up finishing fourth in here, so maybe doesn't flatter the, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Philly, but I think streaming is going to be very fun to watch going forward. Yeah, well, it was pointed out to me after <laughs> the race. First of all, I loved the runner up in this race, and she ran big, taste like candy, uh, bred to be any kind by Candy Ride out of an AP Indy mare who won her debut. Nice. She was going two turns the first time. She was stepping from maiden to grade one, and she got bet. She was the, the five to two second choice to race. Rosalind was a nice filly, a little over bet with her running style to come from last in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. She was bet on class, but her numbers were about the same as the others. Um, but it was pointed out to me after the race set that streaming's damn teaming is out of the sensational mare better than honor, who, as you remember, and fans might remember, produced some outrageous runners, Man of Iron, who won the marathon, the incomparable Rags to Riches, uh, Casino Drive, who won 900000 and, of course, Jazzle. Um, and so the damn sight breeding on this horse is unbelievable. So it was no wonder that... She took the two turns. She was just her figures, her equity based and buyers were just much lower than the rest. It was an 81 coming in. Um, she ended up getting a 90 coming out, which is still lower than Taste of Candy's maiden win. But she was very professional, and and Baffert's got himself a nice oak contender here because you know there's no two, he just has to map out a plan for her next year. But I, I both this, I don't know if this is going to be a um, a key race that's going to put some winners out, but definitely I put both streaming and taste like candy in my Echo Base virtual stable, which is free. So when they start working again next year towards the Kentucky Oaks and some of those nice preps, uh, I want to be watching their races closely. Yeah, it's getting to be that time of year where uh, Hollywood Futurity up next. Uh, we, co of course, had the uh, Breeders' Cup uh, Juvenile, but we also this past weekend, those juvenile races in Kentucky and New York. It's getting to be that time of the year where we're starting to think derby trip and that's always fun. I say what's interesting about that is in horse racing, it's the one true uh, uh, division that has a season. I, I look at these two-year-old races as kind of the preseason, and then yep. you get the regular season in the early part of the three-year-old, and the last preps are kind of those playoffs and then the Triple Crown, the championship, and I think it gives people some, some fun uh, areas to focus on, and so we're getting to that time of year. Ellis, certainly appreciate the visit this morning. As always, thanks for stepping in. Uh, again, as Mike Pena couldn't make it, but I I will remind people, Ellis joins Mike every Friday as they preview stakes action, so keep that on your radar. You can also find Ellis's work on Equibase each and every racing day. Ellis, thanks for the visit. We'll talk again. Thank you very much, Seth. All right. Ellis Starr, again, National Racing Analyst for Equibase. We'll take our next break. When we come back, Catskill, Steve Terjanian, give us some ideas on Monticello for this afternoon. Stay tuned. Missed one of our TV shows? No worries. Now you can catch all your favorite programs online. Simply log on to CapitalOTV.com and click on the YouTube link at the bottom of the homepage. And look for our new podcast coming soon. CapitalOTV.com. Log on today. Fascinated by the world of horse racing? Interested in honing your handicapping skills? Class is in session. Night school. Monday nights. Easy to access online. It's free, interactive, and informative for the casual and serious race fan. Horse player now buzz. Live horses to watch email to you daily. Our eyes, your prize. Night school in the buzz. Visit horseplayernow.com for details. Each morning on the OTB TV network, you get the very best in horse racing programming. Weekdays begin with the Handicappers Report, where professional handicappers share their selections and analysis of the day's racing. Followed by Racing Across America, a daily conversation with racing personalities from around the country. 
Saturdays include Down the Stretch, where Mark Cassano speaks with the biggest names in racing. And Sunday mornings, it's Loose on the Lead, where Steve Bick and I offer news and a unique lineup of weekly guests. All here on the OTB TV Network. Funding your capital OTB bet account is as easy as one, two, three. One, easy money. Clearly the fastest and easiest method of depositing funds into your account. Make deposits or withdrawals in just minutes. Two, Green Dot Money Pack gives you instant access to your funds. Green Dot Money Packs are available at thousands of retailers nationwide. And three, MasterCard Visa. Simply click on the link from the funding page, enter your account information, and fund your account. CapitalOTBPet.com. Log on today. This is Steve Beck. Join me Tuesday through Saturday here on OTB TV for At the Races, my Sirius XM daily news magazine of the thoroughbred industry. Handicapping, interviews, analysis, everything you could want. 6 a.m. OTB TV. Welcome back to Racing Across America on this Monday morning. Happy to be joined now by Steve Turjanian, Catskill Steve. You can find his selections each and every racing day on the Monticello Raceway website. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Seth. How was your Thanksgiving last week? Thanksgiving was great. Very was good. great. Very good. And, uh, Steve, we're going to take a look at uh, some of the Monticello action for this afternoon. Obviously, we're a little further up the pike than you up there in the Albany area, but our weather was a little dicey. Is it, is it similar down there? Uh, yes, it is. Schools, closings, late openings, and uh, whatnot. It's, uh, it's like freezing rain up there now. All right. We'll have to keep our eyes open and, and, and see what the situation is as Monticello's uh, post time gets closer. But we'll give you some ideas nonetheless for this afternoon. Race number two at Monticello, scheduled to be a trot, one-mile trot, obviously, all ages, with a purse of $2,500. Your thought in race two? Okay, Seth, I'm uh, looking at the number five horse in here, East Creek Huck. And uh, this horse raced last time on an afternoon, uh, a brutal afternoon, not as cold as today, but it was brutal, raining, wind, whatever. And the horse left and got a tuck and then made a second move uncovered and uh, conked out, as would be, you know, expected on a day, on a real bad day. And you'll see the time of the race, 2.06 and 4 is like the 1980s uh, time <laughs> back then. And uh, the horse did come in six, lost by four lengths. Some interesting here is that he's got a class edge on these, and he has had difficult spots in recent. He's got the five hole today, and I would look for him to go down the road with uh, Kyle Di Benedetto. Yeah, he has certainly been up against it as far as uh, post position. Seven, eight, the last couple, six prior to that. You got to go down the page to find one where he got out of the four hole. Ran fourth that day, but in a two all one. So, yeah, maybe moving in a, a, at least a couple of spots here to the five today makes this one interesting. As you say, a little yes. class relief as well. Um, Seth, on, on a day like today, um, you have to watch, the folks have to watch for horses that had bad trips today. And it's a good handicapping tool for, uh, well, trip handicapping is always good, but especially at the trotters, not only Monticello, Meadowlands, anywhere you're going to handicap on a day like today. And watch for the horses that had uncovered trips and whatnot. And then in weeks to come, they could be good plays and at prices. At this time of the year, it's, it's a good uh, angle to follow. Yeah, we were talking about something similar on the handicapping show just prior to this in that uh, uh, for folks who kind of keep track of the conditions now on the thoroughbred side, the conditions are so complicated and next time out in the past performances, you know, you only get that abbreviation. So if right. you keep track of the conditions and the, the thing is, like trip handicapping that you mentioned, when you're bringing something to the race that isn't on the printed page, you have an advantage over everybody else. Uh-huh. Third race this afternoon, a, uh, another pace. This one, a, a purse, again, $2,500. Your thoughts in race three? Uh, a little bit of a reach here, Seth, but I'm going to try number three, six cents. Uh, this horse uh, is consistent as the uh, day is long earlier in the year. As you can see, she won 17 races over the past two years and is always around. Um, she took a couple of weeks off, and she came back on the 25th and race overland, and never really getting close, but it was a fast mile, so we can excuse that. And then last week, the uh, last Monday, uh, an interesting race, Mike Forte tried to leave for position. Two horses outside of her left, and they eventually came in uh, one and two. 
and she was used a little bit to get to the uh, pylons, and she finally reached third past the quarter, and the quarter was 28-3. and three. And she chased the rest of the, of the mile, and she had some pace finishing, and she did come in third, losing by less than three lengths. Um, an improved effort, and I'm, I'm just hoping that, uh, you know, she perks up today and regains some of that form she had earlier in the year. And as you can see, she won six, she's won six times on an off track. And uh, I'm giving her a shot here and uh, probably a little better price than she would would get if she was in, uh, you know, in her regular form. All right. Sounds like a good shot in there. The various angles, and particularly the wet track angle, certainly will come into play today. The eighth race this afternoon at Monticello. Again, it's another pace. This one with a purse of $4,100. Your thoughts on race eight? Okay, race eight, Seth. I'm looking at the three. Traveling Genie, who shipped to Monticello last week and had a wide trip. And this horse is in the powerful Renee Allard barn. And uh, he's in the top top three, I believe, in the training wins. Uh, really a tough trip on a fast mile. It was a 157 mile, and she finished evenly. She lost by eight lanes, so she wasn't close, but she did get a check. She came in fourth. What uh, points her out is her race on October 25th at Pocono when she came barreling home from eighth and won in 153 and three. And Better than that, back on October the 5th at Saratoga, the half-mile track from the 7 hole, she made two moves and won fairly easy in a 156 mile. Um, this isn't an easy race by any means, so maybe we'll get a little better price than we should get. But uh, I'm looking at Traveling Genie here from the better spot today. All right, and the, both of those races you pointed out came home in uh, 28 and change, and that today certainly would be a, a, a nice factor. All right, so uh, in race number eight, number three, Traveling Genie. Uh, Steve, certainly appreciate uh, the visit this morning, and uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed the weather holds out. We have some racing this afternoon at Monticello, and good luck on the selections. Again, I'll remind people they can find your selections each racing day on the Monticello Raceway okay. website. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thank you, Seth. Catskill Steve Turjanian from Monticello Raceway will take our last break. When we come back, Teresa Gennaro, Brooklyn Backstretch blog. But again, most recently, you can find her uh, uh, work uh, of various places, Forbes.com, but most recently uh, wrote about the New York Racing Association board meeting last week for the Blood Horse, and that's what we're going to touch on right after this. I'm Jeff Carl. Join me Saturdays and Sundays at 9 for the Handicappers Report. We'll handicap the top tracks across the country and help you prepare for the weekend in racing. That's the Handicappers Report, weekends at 9, only here on the OTB TV Network. The future of online betting is here, and only at the all-new CapitalOTBBet.com. With a newly designed and engineered internet wagering platform, enhanced video streaming, additional funding options, and three new individual wagering opportunities, CapitalOTBBet.com delivers a state-of-the-art wagering experience found nowhere else in horse racing. Combine that with our all-new mobile website. You have two of the most powerful, innovative, and advanced wagering platforms available today. CapitalOTBBet.com. Log on today. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook and get in the game. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, fantastic food and drinks, and amazing Vegas-style atmosphere with seating for nearly 900 of your closest friends. Conveniently located at 711 Central Avenue, right off exit 5 of I-90 in Albany, the Clubhouse Racebook is the better choice. Using CapitalOTBBet.com is as easy as one, two, three. One, simply log on with your username and password from the homepage. Two, fund your Capital OTB account through our Easy Money, Green Dot, or Visa MasterCard options. And three, place your bet on one of our three easy-to-navigate wagering platforms, Capital Bet TV, Capital Bet Express, or Capital Bet Pro. CapitalOTBBet.com. Log on today. I'm Steve Bick, inviting you to join me Sunday, December 15th at the Clubhouse Racebook. I'll be handicapping the day's races live and managing a $500 bankroll for 25 lucky patrons. To be part of the bankroll team, sign up at the Clubhouse Sunday by 1.30. We'll see you then. Let's win together. 
Welcome back to Racing Across America. As promised before the break, we're joined now by Teresa Gennaro, Brooklyn Backstretch blog. Again, she wrote about the New York Racing Association board meeting last Wednesday for the Blood Horse. Also has something up just within the past 24 hours on Forbes.com covering the same issue. Teresa, good morning. Good morning, Seth. How are you? Very good. Wanted to touch on that Naira board meeting. We didn't get a chance to do it last week, but of course the week kicked off with the uh, Franchise Oversight Board meeting. At that point, there was some discussion of raising the prices uh, for tickets at both Saratoga and Belmont. That's kind of the big news that came out of it yesterday. Uh, my partner Steve Bick and I talked on Loose on the Lead of kind of some of the underlying issues, but I do want to touch on something that will affect a lot of the folks up in this area. That the uh, the uh, raise of the uh, prices, the admission prices for both grandstand and clubhouse admission, Belmont and Saratoga. Give us uh, some of the thoughts that came out of the meeting, the reasoning behind it, and also the discussion that was held amongst board me members uh, regarding these uh, r price raises. What I thought was most striking about it is that it was the first board meeting of the, I don't know, six or seven that have been held since the board was reorganized a little over a year ago, where there was actually any disagreement. Most of the time, uh, the board chair, Dr. Scordon from Cornell University, presents the issues, and they've been voted on fairly unanimously with, in fact, very little discussion. This is the first time that several board members um, really said, you know, hold on, we're not sure we can go along with this. And I, I found it very interesting that, um, that this was the issue that caused that level of dissent, almost to the point where, you know, Dr. Scorton was saying to them, look, this is our responsibility, we have to pass this budget because they were not in a position to simply vote up or down on that issue. They had to pass the budget as a whole or not. And if there had been further um, opposition, then the budget itself wouldn't have been passed, which um, Dr. Scorton clearly uh, thought would not be an option for them. And, and there was some pushback from, from particularly uh, Bobby Flay and John Henderson, correct? Um, Bobby Flay, I felt like it was a little bit tough to, to get a read on whether he actually opposed it or not. I don't think he thought it was a good idea to raise it, but he, what he said was um, if, when he had to raise prices in his restaurants, and he acknowledged that there were times where he had to do that, where the rent was going up or food costs were going up, that he also tried to change the experience so that as his customers had to pay more, they felt like they were getting more for their money. So I think he was suggesting that if this were going to happen, that the customer service experience at the tracks would also need to be improved, which is something that he's been kind of banging on about since he, since he joined the board, the experience of being at the track. Um, John Hendrickson, who's not a voting member of the board but a special advisor, was very, very opposed. Um, and Barry Ostrager, who's head um, of New York Thoroughbred Breeders, also expressed some opposition. And he was really the first one. As, as there were many um, comparisons being made to entertainment venues and what a bargain it is to get into a racetrack for $5 for a full day of entertainment, um, Ostrager was the first one who said, but, but this isn't entertainment, this is gambling, and we want our customers to spend money at the windows, not at the turnstile. Yeah, and I'm wondering if there was any discussion, because immediately I said uh, the price increase, I, I don't really have an argument with it. Saratoga, uh, it puts it in line with maybe some other venues, and certainly people are going to go three or four times during the summer. I, I don't think it's that big a deal. But for the people who want to show up at three or four times a week, I think it's a little bit different. Was there any discussion about a cu customer loyalty program? Because immediately, that's what I thought of. Brought it up on the show here. I've seen some buzz on that on the internet as well. And I'm wondering if they talked about it, because I, I heard that at the meeting, uh, Chris Kay, the head of Naira, talked about an improved experience at the races, but it's kind of seemed to be kind of a nebulous concept. Did they talk at all about uh, giving a break to to regular customers, perhaps? There wasn't. Now, what you're saying is you're talking about people who go, you know, maybe a handful of times, and there was no discussion of that in the past. Uh, Naira has always offered season passes, which have offered a significant reduction on costs into both the grandstand or the clubhouse, depending on the price point. Um, I would assume that they will have those again this year. There, there was no discussion of them, and there was definitely not any conversation about, you know, buy 10, get one free sort of thing. But I agree with you. I think that that would um, make this a little bit more palatable. Um, I also, I don't, I don't know how much state, um, state legislation forbids this sort of thing, because I know that there is something in the New York State books that forbids Naira from giving out free admission passes. So I don't know how much they're hamstrung by the state, who you would think at this point would be willing to maybe work on some of those um, outdated laws to, if they need, really need to do this to raise money, um, if it's, and it's going to go through, they're going to revisit it in March, if there's a way to say to customers, look, 
we get that you come here a lot and, you know, let's see if there's a way to make this a little bit more palatable for you. Yeah, I, as I say, I immediately thought of something like, you know, swipe card that after a certain number of visits, your price goes down or, or you get some concession breaks or something. So I, or, again, or how about a betting voucher? I mean, isn't yeah, that the point yeah, of all of this? Yeah. I mean, how about, you know, Good idea. you know, you, you pay your five dollars to get in. And when you bet twenty five or fifty dollars for the day, you get your you get that back as a five dollar betting credit on your voucher or your Naira rewards card. I mean, it just it seems like. And, and, and this is what I read about in Forbes this morning, is if, if the whole goal is to get people to be betting more, this this seems like an easy way to try to raise some money, but without addressing that fundamental issue. Yeah, that's a great idea to somehow tie it in to, yeah, some kind of betting voucher. Let's talk about some of the other things they talked about at the meeting. One of the things, and this is all going around cutting costs. And again, this is something we talked about on the show yesterday. The, 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 this whole discussion of the VLT money being kind of parsed out just seems to me kind of wrong-headed. But that's what they're looking at now. And so they're looking at cutting costs. One of the plans there was to uh, uh, not have horses stabled at Aqueduct uh, during uh, this part of the season where they're not racing there. And I'm just wondering what the conversation was at the board meeting there or any pushback you heard. It seems like for horsemen that would be a, a kind of burdensome. There was no discussion of it at the board meeting at all. I spoke with Rick Violet uh, afterward, and he indicated that there were ongoing conversations about it. Um, he suggested that the closing of Aqueduct was not a done deal, that he's working closely with management, and that he's concerned that, in fact, um, by, by changing the horse population or possibly reducing it, because he thinks that if uh, the horsemen can't be accommodated at Aqueduct or can't train at Aqueduct. They'll go elsewhere. They'll go to Maryland or they'll go to Pennsylvania. That so you could, in fact, be lowering your field size and possibly, therefore, decreasing revenue further by decreasing handle. Um, you know, what, what he said to me was that he thought that, that it's not necessarily about having fewer horses around but having the right horses and that increasing the starts per stall, um, so the number of, you know, the average number of starts that horses on the ground to make would be a better way to think about increasing revenue as opposed to saving money by closing aqueduct. Yeah, again, there were a number of issues discussed at this budget meeting. A lot of them will uh, be interesting going forward as well. So we'll keep our eyes on that. But Teresa, before we let you go, just wanted to talk. We had you on a few weeks ago because you are a board member of the Belmont Child Care Association. You talked a little bit about the holiday party and we prompted people to maybe think about donating to that. That's the party where the kids can come in and pick up gifts for siblings and parents and whatnot. That was held this past Saturday. I know you weren't there uh, personally, but I'm sure you've heard. Uh, how did the event go? Uh, from what from what I heard, everything went great. I was there on Friday helping to set up, and I got there late on Saturday to help break things down a little. Uh, I was up in Saratoga actually celebrating my mom's birthday, which kept me um, away from the party itself. But the the generosity that I saw on Friday, so many gifts that had been donated to help make the backstretch Christmas wonderful for these children, it was really just stunning. I mean, toys and gifts and jewelry and um all kinds of things that the children could go in and pick out for their family members. And when I got there yesterday, there was an, uh, on Saturday afternoon, there was an army of volunteers who had been there helping the children all day and stayed around to help clean up and pack things up. So uh, by all accounts, it was another really successful event um, based largely or due largely to the generosity of volunteers and also of the New York Racing Association, which uh, donated the space to the Turban Field Club on the fourth floor of Belmont um, and a lot of people who helped set up and break that down. So we're really, really grateful to everybody who made it happen. Yeah, that's good to hear. And again, uh, that party is over, but certainly the Belmont Child Care Association can always use uh, the thoughts and donations of folks. If folks go to the Belmont Child Care Association website, they can learn more about it and ways to donate. Teresa, thanks for the uh, visit this morning. Again, your most recent column folks can find on Forbes.com. We appreciate the visit this morning. We'll talk to you again. Great. Thanks, Seth. Teresa Gennaro, again, Brooklyn Backstretch blog. You can find a column uh, covering the Naira board meeting on Forbes, also recently in the Blood Horse. Uh, all summer long, you can find her in the Pink Sheet of the Saratoga and plenty of places to find the work for Teresa Gennaro. Prior to that, it's Catskill Steve Turjanian from Monticello Raceway. We kick things off with Ella Starr from Echo Base, all of which wrap us up for this Monday morning on Racing Across America. We're here every Monday through Friday from 10 to 11 a.m. Prior to that, it's the Handicappers Report every day at 9 a.m.
am. Hopefully on the Handicappers Report, we gave you some good information today. Although Anthony Marmino went through the entire Parks card, and it was only after that that we heard Parks is canceled for this afternoon. But hopefully I gave you some winning thoughts for Finger Lake. So cash some tickets this afternoon. We'll see you again tomorrow morning. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off Track Betting.